applied in this execution of the MoMA distribution method to a single story portal frame. Note that we've got the symmetric structures and symmetric foundations and symmetric loads so that we're going to not include the fact that this thing could possibly sway uh, because in this particular situation it won't. And that of course simplifies a lot of things for us. Now let's note here that we've jotted down for each and every one of the members what the second moment of area is. The columns are identical. The lengths of the columns are identical. Uh, it's just the that the beam is slightly bigger I and it also has a much longer length. So when we take a look at the I's over L's we get these kinds of ratios. Those units are a little weird. They don't matter of course other than being consistent because we're just going to be doing relative values between all of those. right? So if we summed all the I over L's of the members that frame into the joint, there's only two of those. If we sum those at joint B, we get the sum of these two. And that, of course, turns out to be the same thing that happens over at the other joint, joint C. The other thing to take note of is that we're going to get a fixed end moment here associated with the, the beam. And that, of course, is going to come from a plus and minus WL squared over 12 for that fixed end moment. This will be a, a useful thing to remember also as we, we go along. We're going to lock down every the, one of the joints, apply the loads, that's of course where we're going to get the fixed end moments, and our bookkeeping is such that we've got this um, upper left, lower right for the beams, and if you rotate that 90 degrees, doesn't matter which way, you'll get the arrangement of the information for the columns also. And down below, you're going to have all of this already worked out in detail. So we'll, let's step our way through and show some of the arrows that indicate where we started and what we were doing there along the way. Right? So we got the distribution factors for the members. Right? Remember, that's going to be taking the individual members, I over L, and dividing it by the total sum that comes into the joint. So. You know, note back up here, the beam is more flexible than the column, so it's going to end up taking less, and that's sure enough what we have for a distribution factor for the beam. And then this other one, 0.5625, is for the column. Likewise, over here for the other side of things. We apply upper left, lower right for the notation for the beam, so we have minus 144 and 144 for the fixed end moments. Now you say, how do I know with all this math that's here, which one, which joint was released first? And what I look at is I say, okay, there's a 63 here next and a 31.5. This 31.5 is exactly one half of the 63, so aha, the first step in this math that was shown was going and releasing joint B and taking it across over to the 31.5. So we've equilibrated joint B. We come along, oh well, wait a minute, let's really follow this through. Minus 144 times the 0.4375, that's what gave us the 63, and a positive, right, because it has to oppose that. And then 0.5625 times that will give us the 81. Probably 81 and 63 and change, but uh, this was actually done in a spreadsheet as you can tell by the very pretty formatting that's here, so the, the um, this has only been rounded to that particular number. And then that 81 would have also a carryover down to the bottom of the column, but note we're never going to release this column, so we're always going to be carrying over half of everything that happens, and at the bottom of the column, since we're not going to release it, I'm just going to let it all accumulate and then do the carryover at the very end, and that will save me having to try to write all these values up uh, every time, and it saves me a little bit of, of hassle uh, as well. So that's also what's going on in this particular formatting that you see. All right, so that's where the 81 and the 63 come. We put the joint in equilibrium, that's why those lines are there. We've not ever released joint C yet, so let's come over here, sum up all of the effects that are there that are not equilibrated yet, and that's the 144 plus 31.5, and then multiply by the distribution factor, taking the opposing values, meaning negative, and that gets us these two, negative 76.78, and etc. 
And now I take that and because I've locked down everything else, I'm going to show this as a dashed line coming back the other way. That's where the carryover of a half that the minus 38.4 comes from is half of this value of the 76.813. Okay. Same thing with the right hand column. I'm just going to let all of those add up and then at the end do the carryover. All right. So over on back on joint B then, we've got minus 38.4. We need to, to then, we've locked down C. We're going to release then B and we'll have opposing moments that develop in this ratio uh, or association of the distribution factor, so ratio of the relative stiffnesses, and that's where the 16.8 comes from. And that, of course, will kick us over back to the other side to the 8.4, and, of course, we get the 21.6 that comes out of distributing that 38.3. And notice here how the beam having, a, having less stiffness having more flexibility that this unbalanced moment gets shot out to the side that's going to help these numbers go down faster All right, and they're already starting to go down pretty fast so then the 8.4 over here gets redistributed and then that comes back again so on and so forth A lot of people don't draw the arrows because in these frames because, of course, it starts to get pretty convoluted as you're doing that. Um, and we continue this progression until it gets real small. This is way more small and refined than I ever, ever do by hand. Um, but, of course, it's in the spreadsheet. It will it'll go on for however long I like to uh, let it go on. And so at some point it gets so small that we say, okay, that's good enough. We put our double lines in, indicating that we are stopping. Um, even if we're not perfectly converged, we're going to go ahead and stop anyways and tally up the columns of data. And that gives us the minus 103.7, 103.7 over here at joint B, equal opposite moments. They better be. Same kind of thing happens at C. The signs are changed. And then I do this carryover to the base of the column. Bam. There you go. All right, so let's compare that to what our approximate answers were. Right? Key thing here, 103.7 at B and the 51.8 down at the base. And our one-tenth rule said that we thought maybe we'd get 70, about 78 at the joints, and we would get about 39 down at the base of the columns. And so, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? Well, let's go back and take a look at what the what this implication is for the equilibrium of that beam right because our approximation was based upon the one tenth rule and so if we look at that beam the whole 24 foot length of it then its equilibrium is such that we've got of course the three kips per foot. We've got the end shears. Those will still be 36. We didn't guess that wrong. It's just that the end moments are different than what we had predicted they would be. There's, of course, an axial force here as well. And now let's go draw the moment diagram that would... Well, actually, let's do the shear diagram, and then we'll do the moment diagram. So if this is the shear diagram, it's going to look just like we would expect it to look, just like actually a simply supported beam that is symmetrically set up with the loading and everything, and that's effectively what we kind of have here. All right, still 36 there, minus 36 there. None of that has changed. It has a slope of negative 3 kips per foot. The moment diagram, on the other hand, is going to be down here at minus 103.7 on both sides. Right? It's going to be second order. It's going to peak in the middle. 
right? Well, now that change is the same change that we get for a simply supported beam. In other words, that's WL squared over 8. But that WL squared over 8 for a simply supported beam, it comes from, remember this is going to be w over, WL over 2 times L over 2 times 1 half for it being a triangular area. That's where WL squared over 8 is coming from. That's coming, that, that's a baseline of a zero moment. But we don't. We start off with a negative moment. So that second order, simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load, the moment diagram can be thought of here as the exact same thing, just with a different reference position. And that total height of it will be WL squared over 8, which is, I think, about 216 and change or something like that. Let's check it out. Uh, 3 times the 24 squared divided by the 8. Yep, 216. Total change. Minus the 103.7 will give us 112.3. Well, that's kind of interesting. So from the inflection point over, then we have 112.3. That's interesting. So that means our shear has gone from zero to some value such that this area is going to be 112.3. Huh. Well, that area is one half of, let's call that distance x. So x, and then that shear grows at 3 times x. I know it's a negative. I'm not going to worry about that part yet. And that will be equal to 112.3. Solve that for x, and you're going to get, right, this is really negative here. That's really negative there. So therefore, the negatives cancel out, right? All right, so that x will turn out to be 8.65 feet in change. That's this portion, minus 12, 3.35-ish here to the inflection point. And 3.35 divided by 24 would mean that the point of inflection is at the 0.14L location, not at the 0.1L. So in reality, we were our approximation was off and it was off too close to the support and that meant that um, our max negative moment on the edges was not big enough and that had a carryover impact to the base of the column and it also means that we overestimated what the maximum positive bending moment would be because right? we got this segment here too long and that's what made this too big we weren't ter terrible, though. I mean, 138 compared to the 112 is an awful. On the other hand, we had only had about 78 here for the negative moment at the ends when it should have been uh, about 104. Right? But it tells us that maybe when we think about having what turns out to, I think, to be sort of like a 3 sevenths, 4 sevenths relationship here where the columns are stiffer, that, oh, this is more like, hey, the columns are stiffer. This is more like the fixed fixed case as far as the beam is concerned than it is a pin pin. And so maybe we might want to think about um, adjusting not in the, the middle between 0 and 0.21L in our approximation and go to 0.1L, but rather shift it over towards the 0.21. Not all the way, but um, a, a little bit uh, more so. And that would have gotten us closer. Maybe we would have chosen this. It would have gotten a lot closer in the approximate approximation of the moments.